Today, whatever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may go, you are a part of atomic warfare. In laboratories and in the field, in little known places and ways, units of the defense establishment of the United States are learning to work with atomic weapons. In an age when most military engagements have become distant and impersonal, SEALs operate in the midst of the enemy. Their purpose is to disrupt his supply lines, choke his communications, learn his secret. One of the problems uh, in, in, in the manufacture of the fat man bomb was to make the explosive lenses. And this was a problem of casting explosive. And I, I suspect that certainly the best in the country, maybe the only place in the country where, where they were casting explosives and machining explosives was at Saltwell's pilot plant. So we had a program here that, that funded, it was funded by the SEALs to make stuff for them anyway. They're the, weapon, the weapons experts of the world. And now, what's so special about that? After the Second World War, atom bombs were something really new, and they were something special. They were war winners, and they were called special weapons before there was a potentially confusing special warfare catch-all for rangers and commandos and swimmers and other unconventional sorts. China Lake's involvement in the development and testing and fielding and support of the specials, the technologies, the components, the support equipment, and the tactics covers a lot more than most people know. From the strategic to the sneaky, the station was well involved for a very long time. Both ends of the special spectrum were special. Unconventional, that is. Different. And they certainly represented the opposite extremes of modern combat. The screaming, siren-shouting, end-of-the-world enormity of the one-button, one-city scenario versus the silent, selective, elegant precision of the one-shot, one-kill ideal. Brinksmanship versus Phoenix. Either end was difficult to discuss. The secretive nature of the extremes required special access, that vaunted Q clearance, with its restricted data and its old-time sigmas, the limited need to know for SEAL or SOG or Phoenix, or anything with the nearly mystical special operations attached. And then there were those things that nobody wanted to talk much about. Nuclear anythings on one end, and the exploding rocks and trees that they showed to the president on the other and the ashtrays. And, soon enough, the dolphins too that Knotts had been talking to. The special things at either end of the spectrum tended to be especially secret too. And there's just not as much film available of the spec weapons in the lab or of the spec warriors in the field. After all, that special stuff wouldn't be special if everybody knew about it. There were special places at China Lake that went with that. Near mythical and mostly misunderstood Building X and its ancient neighbors, A and T, all in their own secret compound. And that mysterious little tower across the road that went with them. And, of course, there's X-Pad, with its fabled pits. Pretty straightforward loading area in its day, but so very secret. There's the mostly forgotten LC building down the way, with its odd mods for much later projects. And there's Salt Wells, where for years almost no one could go, with its barricades and fences and guard towers, and its several CT areas generally forgotten to signify a camel test. Far-flung FLR-3, with its own private labs and shops and target village. The mysterious Tiara lab, built really just to keep darkness in, but so near to Building X. And any number of darkly rumored sub-basements in otherwise mundane buildings. 
There was even the MicLab machine shop's whimsically billed iron curtain, behind which were fabricated models of atomic missiles, and bits of Elsie's, and Boar's, and Big Stoops, Hopi's, and Marlin's, while hidden from curious co-workers and would-be Rosenbergs alike. But those special things were unrelated to special services, at least at China Lake. China Lake's involvement in special weapons goes back to the very beginning. It's and theirs. A highly secret sub-element of the Manhattan Project, Project Camel, was carried out here at unique facilities, within their own fences, and far from the more populated areas of the base. The wartime Navy Caltech team tested airframes and drop dynamics. And they could recover the test items at China Lake. They proof tested the assembly equipment before it went to Tinian. And at the Saltwells pilot plant, they prototyped and produced explosive lenses for the early A bombs, establishing production means and methodologies that would help provide the devices of deterrence for the coming Cold War. Saltwells' true mission wasn't officially acknowledged until many years after the war, and long after the plant had been closed as an AEC facility and turned over to the Navy. Even then, not many knew the extent of the station's involvement in the atomic, and some even denied it for decades. Few knew that China Lake supported early atomic testing too, developing and deploying cloud sampling rockets. Live warheads never made it to China Lake, nor their nuclear materials, but just about everything else did. Setting aside Polaris and China Lake's significant and long secret role in the origins of sea-based deterrence, that's another story all on its own. The station tested the shapes and the fuses, burned the explosive loaded cases, and rammed ICBM motors into immovable objects to see what might happen in an accident. It evaluated atomic artillery shells, gently catching them in mid-flight. And it improved special weapon magazine designs. And helped develop the delivery methodologies and some of the weapons release hardware. China Lake slickened the airframes and optimized them for maximum penetration through earth and rock and concrete and water. Ballistics improvement prompted some of the station's early special weapon efforts. Turning the TX-8 gun type into the TX-11 LC and helping it survive to penetrate and detonate became a major program and spawned a storied structure in the process. The station had its own specials too, being developed as part of its in-house rocket mix bore from the air, big stoop from the ground, and marlin from beneath the surface of the sea. Urgently needed fleet standoff weapons, advanced ones for their day, and designed for in-stock warheads that never came near China Lake. With that nuclear madness that helped define the 1950s, the station for a time pursued Diamondback a sort of super sidewinder with an atomic option. And Hopi, an advanced bore more or less. The highly secret Thunderbird and North Star, a very high-tech boost glide weapon concept that might supplement the up-and-coming sub-launched missiles. Special weapon delivery tactics too were developed and practiced at China Lake, without warheads of course. A significant part of Tenet Squadron VX-5's mission was to define and refine those tactics, dive and loft and over-the-shoulder techniques that might get the delivery aircraft and its pilot out of the blast zone in time. No mean feat in the pre-computer era. 
submarines had become a special threat by the late 1950s. Hard to find and hard to hit, and some were being filled with atomic-tipped ballistic missiles. So the station, China Lake and Pasadena, also worked on and tested atomic torpedoes, but not the warheads. Atomic-capable subrocks and ASROCs and atomic depth bombs with cute names like Lulu and Betty, but not the warheads, were dropped, launched, shot down the tracks, and set on fire to ensure their reliability, operability, and safety. In 1955, Knotts was assigned the acceptance program for Navy nukes, reliability, operability, safety, and suitability engineering. And for some years, China Lake maintained a unit at the Naval Air Special Weapons Facility at Albuquerque to do just that. The Knotts Group, which would become part of the Naval Weapons Evaluation Facility, was tasked with weapon evaluation, safety and security certification, and storage, handling, and loading procedures, as well as vulnerability, survivability, and all environment safety. As the Cold War dragged on, the station was drawn into the dubious realm of the tactical nuclear arsenal, TACNUC. During the 50s, as the warheads got smaller, China Lake had had to plan for atomic options for all sorts of things, even air-to-air -air missiles. And there came to be TACNUC options for damn near anything. Walleye, Harpoon, Condor, and the cruise missiles that would blur the line between tactical and strategic. On the other end of the spectrum, the other side of the special, the subtle, sneaky world of the special warfare community, Spec War, or Spec Ops. Celebrated in song and story, and elevated to near divinity, commandos, rangers, shaggy fellows with dubious vehicles and extra deadly weapons, parachutes, rubber boats, stranger things, from both sides of the aisle, cut a rather romantic swath through a war of stealth and sabotage and dirty tricks. The Navy had its aptly named swimmers, who became the archetype of the spec warrior, the US Navy SEALs, with their specialized weapons of all sorts, small, subtle, brutally effective, sometimes crude, but often elegant, portable into nearly every imaginable extreme of nature and of man in absolute stealth. Not that the line between the specials never wavered, there was a time that certain spec war types practiced to deliver certain special weapons, very special, very secret, and outside of either side of China Lake's special missions. The station's contributions to the arcana of the SEALs and their Special Forces brethren included everything from exploding rocks to face paint sticks. Pretty much whatever the operators wanted, they could come to China Lake and get. And they did. The SEALs asked for and got things as fundamental as the duckbill attachment for the service shotgun and magazine protectors timer-fired mortars, and some small discarded items you'd better not pick up. They got the nearly legendary 50 Sasser sniper rifle and the pump M79 that's evidently become a mainstay of the moronic computer gaming crowd in the years since. Not special weapons in the parlance of the day, but special purpose, specialized weapons, specialized radios, Specialized cameras and watches and flashlights and beacons. Things that kept away sharks and things that lit up the dark. Specialized submersibles and other things. China Lake's Special Operations Division had its own shops and test ranges and targets. At one time, it had its own village to operate with, way out at Mythic FLR-3. But it wasn't only Forster's group, as it was often known, that provided special devices to the special operators. From all over the station, 
China Lakers contributed their expertise in warheads, propulsion, and fusing, electronics and machining, chemistry and hydrodynamics, and other things. Even at the lake, not all that many people knew what was going on in that special operations vein. But even early on, there was interest at the highest levels, as the nation ramped up for so-called unconventional and limited warfare. And China Lake's special warfare program was broader, less conventional perhaps, than simply supporting the new generation of special forces. Oddball weapons, facts, and rocks, sensors and PA systems, landing zone clearing devices, chemiluminescent compositions for target marking and map reading. The center's unparalleled expertise in energetics was applied to small anti-armor rounds, specialized bullets and grenades and rocket heads and more secret things. And a lot of these were already in Southeast Asia before the nightly news had headlined Vietnam, before China Lake had become heavily involved with the new SEAL operators. The station's inborn links to its fleet customers would help ensure the maintenance of that relationship. And larger things, SEAL team-wise, would follow on in short order. More than the small arms, electronics, support equipment, and surprises from FLR-3. But full-scale SDVs, those oddly shaped little submersibles, specialized liquid explosives, and the UEU anti-ship mine, which evolved into the highly flexible, highly deadly, limpet assembly modular, the LAM. And as the nature of conflict evolves, China Lake remains involved with the special operations community, helping to provide the tools of the trade, helping to deal with the things the bad guys leave behind. And guiding missiles from well behind the lines wouldn't be special if everybody knew about it. And here, in a new age, where Navy SEALs take center stage, and duck and cover drills may well come back to haunt us, the specter of spec war remains. It may be a different sort of Cold War coming, and a very different sort of hot. And special may no longer mean quite the same thing. But, as yesterday's special becomes mundane, the challenge for the laboratory will remain to stay a step ahead of both the revolutionary and the re-emerging at both extremes of the spectrum. But that's another story. Charlie Range trains pilots in nuclear bomb delivery. Here at Charlie Range, a Navy pilot roars down the flight line 50 feet off the ground in a bombing maneuver which will allow him to enter enemy territory undetected.
deliver a nuclear weapon and escape. Traveling at more than 500 knots, he releases a practice bomb which continues on up to 12,000 feet. As he rolls his plane in an effort to follow a course previously calculated to assure his escape from the bomb blast. Here, 27 to 37 seconds after release, a small practice bomb explodes about 100 yards from the target. The maneuver you just saw was developed here at Knott's Channel Lake by VX-5. Working together as a team, VX-5 and Knott's have developed men, facilities, instrumentation and training techniques which have been adopted by all the armed services in their pilot training program. One of Charlie Range's unique training aids, the sky screen timer, goes to work as the jet flies over it. As the jet approaches the target along the flight line, it trips a series of photocells located in the sky screen timing device. And the signal is relayed to this panel. This way, the position of the jet on the flight line is known at all times. All of the equipment used in this training aid is located in the Charlie Range Tower, where an operator takes such data as the jet's speed and compiles important information about the pilot's bombing run. The data comes from this recorder, where a permanent record is made of the true ground speed, point of pull-up, elapsed time between pull-up and bomb release, elapsed time between bomb release and bomb impact. Knowing the time between bomb release and bomb impact, the operator can calculate how far away the aircraft was from the target at the time the bomb exploded. As the aircraft comes within range of the profile tracking station, located about 8,000 feet down the flight line from the control tower, the second training aid goes into operation. The tracker follows the jet visually in its entire maneuver over the target area. The movement of this tracking mount as it follows the aircraft is transmitted electronically to the control tower. The operator, using an XY plotter, puts it on calibrated graph paper. Here is recorded graphically a complete profile of the entire maneuver as it is transmitted by the tracking mount. The time of pull-up and the time of bomb release are also recorded on the graph. The training officer takes the visual profile of the flight and compares it with a template of the ideal profile. He evaluates the pilot's profile and then advises him of his errors while he is getting into position for another run. This quick service is one of the outstanding features of Charlie Range facility. The third training aid goes into operation here at the Impact Spotters Tower. Three such towers are located alongside the flight line so that the spotters are able to see and triangulate the impact with respect to the target. They call the control tower where the plotting board is located. Using the readings from the different spotters, the operator can locate the impact point and measure the miss distance. The information is relayed to the training officer who in turn calls the pilot and gives him the last item in the total flight profile report. They conclude their communication with this report. And another pilot begins his run. This way, Charlie Range can take care of four or five pilots at the same time. With training aids such as sky screen timing, profile plotting, and impact plotting, a small crew of seven or eight men working at knots will continue to send pilots to the fleet who are so well trained in nuclear bomb delivery 
they can destroy any target in the world. To assist the fleet in accomplishing simulated attacks, this station provides well-marked targets and supplies data on the positions of the attacking aircraft and of weapons during the critical phases of each strike. The target provided for this strike consisted of a bullseye 100 feet in diameter. First warning of the delivery plane's approach came by radio from station reconnaissance aircraft over the Mojave area. Ground control continued to receive radio data on the strike plane's positions until station radar acquired the aircraft. Radar signals resulting from acquisition of the delivery aircraft were channeled through a computer to an automatic plotting board. The board presented continuous elongated horizontal and vertical traces of the strike plane's position in space. As the delivery plane made a closer approach to the target, time warnings were issued to ground camera crews. An F-2H-3 aircraft delivered the bomb while executing a 70-degree dive. The first strike was made with a Mark 7 weapon. Radar and ground cameras tracked the event from release to aerial burst. The second strike from the Shangri-La was made by an AD-6 carrying a Boer weapon. The rocket-propelled special weapon was released in a loft maneuver at the initial point south of the target center. Trajectory of the bore was also documented until it burst above ground. The point of detonation demonstrated clearly that this special weapon would have devastated its target. The final strike was delivered by an AD-5N, which also released a bore in a loft maneuver. This time, the pull-up point was determined electronically by the aircraft radar set to range on reflectors placed at the target center. With the delivery of this last bore weapon to its target, another one of the many simulated attacks against the Naval Ordnance Test Station was considered successfully executed. On the Special Weapons Delivery Training Range at Knott's, a B-47 is perfecting its loft delivery techniques. This maneuver consists of flying toward the target at low altitude, then executing a half loop, during which the bomb is released. As the bomb continues in upward flight, the plane rolls over to a level flight attitude in the direction from which it came. This tactic permits a pilot to pull away safely after delivering nuclear bombs from low altitudes.
The 32-inch rocket, Knott's Model 401A, is a large two-stage bombardment rocket. When completely assembled, it is 50 feet in length and weighs well over five tons. The propulsive units for both stages are solid propellant rocket motors. Each motor can deliver 50 tons of thrust for four seconds. The two parts of the body are rigidly joined on the launcher with a connector ring which is automatically jettisoned after the booster is expended. The skids for each part are designed to travel on a two-rail launcher and are of different heights so that they leave the launcher rail simultaneously at the end of launching. This feature eliminates tip-off. When the skids have served their purpose, they are automatically jettisoned, leaving the rocket free of non-functional projections while in flight. The missile and the booster are stored in a temperature-controlled building until the day of firing. About 72 hours of conditioning are required to bring the large propellant grains in each motor to a uniform temperature. Because very close control is required, a manually operated, traveling gantry crane is used to lift the missile from the trailer and place it on the launcher. Bolting the skid guides to the skid permits the missile to rest on a single support without danger of tipping. The same vehicle is used to bring the booster from the assembly building to the launcher. The booster is moved into place and brought to rest a few inches from the missile in preparation for mating. Flanges on the two components are used in making the connection. Flares are attached to aid tracking. The initial part of the raising operation is carried out with two truck cranes. The crane operators synchronize their manipulations to keep both cables in equal tension. As the launcher body is raised, the rollers at the foot of the A-frame strut move into guiding tracks. The tracks keep the strut properly aligned during the raising operation. With the launcher at a quadrant elevation of 50 degrees and preparations complete, the area is cleared. This firing covers the test of the second live single-stage rocket. The tracking flares are ignited at minus eight seconds. Ignition of the motor is simulated with a smoke puff. These high-speed camera scenes were taken to record launching characteristics. Observe the skids being jettisoned immediately after the rocket leaves the launcher. This leaves the missile free of any superfluous external projections. Was that? Certainly the most familiar of the military memorials at China Lake is Armitage Field, even if some people still call it NAF, nearly 40 years after the demise of that entity. The field, which once hosted NAF China Lake and a number of interesting tenants, as well as VX-5, later VX-9, was dedicated in honor of Lieutenant John Murray Armitage in May of 1945. Armitage had survived a great deal of combat and the sinkings of two carriers in the Pacific before he came to Inyokern. But his nemesis would be a small, hidden flaw in the aircraft from which he launched an experimental bunker-busting rocket, a monster in its day facetiously monikered Tiny Tim. 
The death of the heroic and popular young aviator hit the entire station hard, and the new Knott's Experimental Air Center was named Armitage Field by general acclamation before the runways were even cleared for use. The loss of Jack Armitage would not be the last, nor would his be the final memorial at China Lake. Little remembered now is that Inukern Airport, that small regional field in the shadow of the Sierra that once provided the cramped and bumpy early morning hop to LAX, was China Lake's original aviation foothold in the Indian Wells Valley. The former Army Auxiliary Landing Field was commandeered by the Navy for secret wartime projects, and it was dedicated Harvey Field in May 1944 in honor of Lieutenant Commander Warren W. Harvey, a Naval Academy classmate of Captain Burroughs and noted innovator of fighter tactics, who had been killed in action in the Pacific. Although the station was never actually based at Inukern, its earliest air operations were conducted there while the China Lake Field, Armitage Field, was being built. Built not only to handle the Navy tactical aircraft of the day, but for heavily loaded and highly classified B-29s as well. The Bohr atomic weapon, suspended above 800 gallons of burning aviation gasoline, caught fire after 9 and 4 tenths minutes and detonated 20 seconds later. This test, conducted October 30th, 1957, was one of the first of a series of naval atomic weapon vulnerability tests. The jet-propelled aircraft, the high-velocity rocket, and the need for an accurate and efficient delivery of special weapons payload has accelerated the requirement for a new bomb director system. Because of past experience in the development of aircraft fire control systems utilizing magnetic analog computers, Knotts was delegated the responsibility of designing and developing the Mark 10 bomb director system for the Bureau of Aeronautics. The Mark 10 Mod O bomb director system, so-called when used with the AN-APG-53 radar, consists of a combination of easily replaceable plug-in units built to the Navy's new standard dimensions for electronic equipment. Weapons may be delivered by toss bombing, by loft bombing, and over-the-shoulder bombing. The complete installation exclusive of the radar and Mark 17 site weighs about 50 pounds and occupies approximately 1,200 cubic inches of space in the aircraft. The radar weighs 40 pounds and the Mark 17 site weighs about one pound. The Mark 10 system schedule calls for coincident mass production along with the production of the A4D3 aircraft and will be readily adaptable for use in any Navy attack aircraft. The modular design makes possible the dispersal of manufacturing facilities without sacrificing interchangeability and accuracy. 
The standardization leads to a design that is easily adaptable to economical mass production techniques. Designed and developed to meet the requirements of present and future aspects of the increasingly more complex weapons delivery technique, the Mark 10 bomb director system continues to distinguish itself from test to test. A method of launching the intermediate range ballistic missile from the sail of a submarine is currently under study. In concept, the launcher containing the ballistic missile is released vertically and rises to the surface through its own buoyant force, where a hydrostatic switch then fires the missile. Force of the rocket exhaust blows clear of the launcher nose and the rocket leaves the container for its target. Feasibility of this method for launching the IRBM has progressed to the preliminary testing stage. The test configuration used is an Aero 6C aircraft rocket launcher modified to carry only the central round, a 2.75 inch Mighty Mouse rocket. Here we see the launcher's tail fairing, which contains all the underwater release mechanisms, ballast, the firing pin, batteries, and the hydrostatic switch. For these tests carried on at the Morris Dam test ranges, the launcher was loaded with a dummy round in place of the live rocket to safeguard against possible erratic exit trajectories. The launcher with four stabilizing fins around its tail fairing was carried to the test area. There it was attached to a buoy connected on one end to a pulley anchored to the reservoir floor and lowered to the release depth of 20 feet to the nose of the launcher. A flash bulb marks the instant of launcher release. An exploder in the launcher nose blows off the nose cap. Tests like these were made to check out the firing circuit and to assess the reliability of vertical water exit. Until vertical exit was assured, no live rounds would be fired. The six foot by 10 inch launcher was next tested at San Clemente Island. After initial checkout of the firing circuit with dummy rounds, live 2.75 inch rockets were used as payload. The launchers were lowered from the barge off the island coast in the same manner as at Morris Dam and to the same 20 foot depth. With an exit velocity of 25 feet per second, only 1.1 seconds elapsed from launcher release to rocket firing. As expected, the blast of the rocket exhaust blew off the nose fairing and forced the launcher back underwater in the first moments. Results of these tests fulfilled all expectations, bringing to a close this phase of the feasibility study. Future work already underway includes testing of larger missiles and launchers from greater depths in rougher seas. Marlin is a proposed torpedo tube launched, inertially guided missile. This full scale model of the missile is 20 and 1 half feet long and weighs 3,700 pounds. Launched in a horizontal position, Marlin automatically performs an upward turn to a preset pitch angle. When this angle is reached, the rocket motor fires and Marlin is propelled out of the water and onto an inertially guided ballistic trajectory. During this feasibility study, two critical problems were explored. First, could Marlin perform an underwater turn from a horizontal position and exit from the water at an angle of 72 degrees? And second, would the missile be aerodynamically stable during the initial air flight trajectory? This full-scale test vehicle was fabricated from Mark 18 torpedo parts. The guidance and control section contains elements of a B-29 autopilot and modified Sidewinder servos. Roll and yaw are controlled by the differentially operated vertical canards. Pitch is controlled by the horizontal canards. At the Morris Dam torpedo range, tests were made to determine the feasibility of making an underwater turn. This negatively buoyant rail launcher is equipped with detachable floats. Floated into position beneath the variable angle launcher, the Marlin launcher with the missile attached is secured to cables and winches for lowering, and the floats are detached. Two five-inch auxiliary rockets were used to approximate the velocity of a submarine tube ejection. 
They were separated from the missile shortly after firing. Vertical sensing instruments mounted on the Marlin launcher help to maintain an even keel as it is submerged. At the 60-foot depth, the control system is activated. Booster rockets fired and with a simulated tube ejection velocity of 60 feet per second, Marlin emerges from the water at a 60 degree attitude. Water exit velocity was 38 feet per second. These tests at Morris Dam demonstrated Marlin's ability to make a turn underwater, but the question remained, would the missile be aerodynamically stable during the initial air flight trajectory? For this phase of the test, the launcher was loaded aboard an LCU at San Clemente Island. This test vehicle's rocket motor had a thrust of 16,000 pounds, the same as that planned for Marlin, but with a shorter burning time. Television and motion picture cameras supply underwater data on the launching. After firing, these five-inch booster rockets will be separated from Marlin by restraining cables attached to the launcher frame. It was planned that after launching, the missile should attain a 62-degree pitch attitude. The motor would fire, and the missile leave the water at approximately 100 feet per second. The water exit was at the desired attitude, smooth and clean, and at a velocity of 85 feet per second. The missile was aerodynamically stable during the initial air flight after water exit. The water exit under full thrust and the initial air flight trajectory were the important features of this Marlin test. that doing there? This fading, crumbling crosswalk is pretty much all that's left of Grove School, a Navy school named for an Army general, now subsumed into the desolation that was once the greater portion of the China Lake community. The school was named for Major General Leslie R. Groves, who headed the World War II Manhattan Project, America's massive, complex quest for the atomic bomb project in which China Lake was intimately involved from its inception. 
At Navy insistence, the project paid for the school, along with some supplemental housing and part of Bennington Plaza, to support Manhattan Project personnel secretly being sent to China Lake. Captain Burroughs also convinced General Groves to fund runway extensions that would enable the airfield then under construction to handle heavily loaded B-29s, the very presence of which would also be highly classified. Project Camel, the station's role in the creation of the atom bomb, was a closely held secret for a long time, although naming the school after the general should have been a pretty big clue. Throughout the centuries, the greatest, if not the only, threat to civilization has been man himself. Since his earliest days, the way man has reacted to a situation has created conflict. Generally, we are able to determine when a conflict is limited and when it is not. But we cannot state the precise point when a conflict stops being limited and begins to escalate into war. As man developed the art of warfare, weapon obsolescence began to act as an important stimulus to research and development programs. In the past, relatively slow technological advances allowed nations to stockpile the means for defense. more gunpowder, muskets and cannonballs that were stored, the more secure a country could feel. Obsolescence was not yet a critical problem since the same weapons were useful for many years and in a variety of applications. Time was available after the first shot had been fired to develop and mass produce weapons for war. However, today's world, with its explosively expanding technology, has accelerated the process of obsolescence to an incredible degree.
although it is unlikely that the free world will strike the first blow, it must and is building a strong and invulnerable deterrent weapon system. These strategic weapons remain useful, however, primarily as a restraint to all-out nuclear warfare. The defense picture is further complicated since a complete arsenal of lesser weapons allowing for immediate reaction to any threat throughout the spectrum of conflict is also required. The nuclear stalemate has not served to inhibit violence. In fact, it has allowed the enemy to resort increasingly to the use of all types of non-nuclear weapons in the prosecution of unconventional and limited warfare actions. In counteraction to the philosophy of continuing weapon obsolescence, scientific personnel of the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station, China Lake and Pasadena, California, are actively engaged in all phases of the research and development spectrum. A tactical problem which frequently occurs in South Vietnam has generated a need for the weapon which will be demonstrated in this next event. Guerrillas attack a given area. Then, knowing that helicopters will be used to deploy troops to the air, uh, that area, cover nearby clearings suitable for landing with sharp vertical bamboo poles. A helicopter pilot, unable to see these poles, cannot safely land. He needs a practical, expedient, and reliable means to clear a prospective landing site. Your television monitor shows a close-up view of a group of poles staked out in the area R, with trees as a jungle background. A helicopter seeking to land there could drop a Zuni continuous rod warhead to clear the landing area. The Zuni warhead deploys a rapidly expanding ring of steel rod in a horizontal plane, cutting the poles. Result, instant heliport. This weapon will effectively clear an area 60 feet in diameter and is scheduled for delivery to ARPRA under Project Agile in the very near future. A substantial program in warhead research is being conducted at knots to develop more efficient damage mechanisms. One technique making use of a detonating vapor is called FAX, an acronym for Fuel Air Explosive. FAX has entered the weaponization stage with the development of an aerial bomb, a bazooka round, and various land mines. Now, in this demonstration, a FAX bomb will be ground-fired adjacent to the B-29 aircraft at position S. Mr. President, I have a slow motion film clippage which I'm going to project on your television monitor so you may see the action in slow motion. Run the film clip. A number of fax bombs will be delivered to ARPA under Project Agile in the near future. Another significant program at Knott's is the specialized application of explosives and chemicals to all phases of warfare. 
One among these is the use of plastic bonded explosives, PBX. The character of this material permits it to be molded into different sizes and shapes or to be filled with fragments and dye. These characteristics have been exploited in designing warheads for rockets and missiles, as well as specialized uses in counter-insurgency warfare. Now, as an illustration of the fiendish potentialities for PBX, one nasty trick is to make disguised landmines by molding PBX in the shape of and color of rocks common to an area. Dropped along roads or paths, these rocks will detonate upon any future disturbance. A mechanism is provided which will make them inoperative after a stimulated period of time. Following the firepower demonstration, Mr. Kennedy drove to Michelson Laboratory, one of the world's most complete weapon research and development centers. Knott's technical progress during the 20 years since its founding was illustrated in an exhibit arranged about the main entrance to the laboratory. Michelson Laboratory is the heart of the Knott's complex. The building encompasses more than 10 acres of floor space, all serving the far-reaching needs of research and development. In this building, a weapon system may grow from concept to final fabrication. On display in a closed security area were new weapons and instruments devised for unique applications in limited war actions and counterinsurgency missions. Mr. Kennedy was able to review hardware and data on weapon systems which had been demonstrated, as well as other items not suited to a firepower demonstration. Under Project Agile, ARPA is evaluating certain knots developed ordnance in Southeast Asia. Some of the material is explosive ordnance, such as was witnessed during the firepower demonstration. Other items include seismic instruments for pinpointing the step of a man at 200 yards distance and a miniature public address system powered by a tiny gasoline generator. Tierra is a system for dispensing a low intensity luminescent material into a tactical area to facilitate surveillance.
within the propulsion department of the Naval Ordnance Test Station, an inconspicuous but nevertheless useful technology is maintained for the development of a number of diverse products. Among the items produced are books, leather goods, rocks, lamps, and even logs, to name a few. Often, for reasons of authenticity, a particular item will be ornamental as well as utilitarian. However, the primary utility, which is common to all of these objects, is covert. Each is manufactured from a plastic bonded explosive material. The attractive ashtray in this film serves as an example and will explain the purpose of all of our seemingly unrelated objects. The various devices could be detonated by an embedded contrivance sensitive to sound, shock, a keyed transmission, or perhaps the heat from a burning cigarette. The co-star of this picture, along with the ashtray, is a durable steel actor known as Sam, who will be used again in future experiments. Imagine what could result with a group of people standing around the desk when the ashtray exploded. And Sam, did I say we would use him again? Was that? Vice Admiral Frederick L. Ashworth, one of China Lake's atomic admirals. He was, like several others, notably Chick Hayward and Levering Smith, intimately involved with the Navy's special weapons programs from their inception. These were technologically astute officers, highly accomplished and highly respected by both military and civilian communities, operationally and technically. All attained three stars, and stellar reputations. Possibly the best known of China Lake's atomic admirals, Dick Ashworth should be a familiar name to anyone familiar with the top secret technology that finally ended the Second World War. Dick Ashworth was the weaponeer on the Nagasaki mission, the guy in command of the weapon. Like Parsons at Hiroshima, it was a U.S. Navy officer who actually dropped the bomb. Ashworth later served as the station's commander during the mid-50s, and he was the first to actively market China Lake's extensive RDT&E capabilities, even capabilities beyond Sidewinder. China Lake's first experimental officer, Vice Admiral John Tucker Hayward, known by all as Chick, held a unique and powerful position at the station. And he was a key player in Project Camel, China Lake's Manhattan Project role coordinating drop testing of weapon shapes and piloting the B-29 himself on many of the test missions. A colorful character of great technical ability and deep insight, Chick Hayward may well be best remembered for his tacit allowance of his ship's unofficial adoption of an orphaned Korean infant. Levering Smith, Vice Admiral Sir Levering Smith, served as both a technical department head and associate technical director during an extended tour at China Lake unheard of for an active duty officer. As technical director of the Polaris Missile Program, he helped bring China Lake deep into the creation of the nation's submarine-based deterrent force. But that's another story. 
All of the atomic admirals were instrumental in the station's involvement in significant programs. The Manhattan Project, Sidewinder, and Polaris, to name only a few. All were active in the community, and all remained tied to China Lake for decades after their duty tours. Uh, I'm delighted to be back here. I guess if you look at deeply in some of the sand, you'll find some of my blood mixed up with it because I had... And all should be better remembered, here. especially at China Lake, than by a fading blue sign in a demolished neighborhood where disintegrating streets are slowly consumed by scrub. most interesting and versatile ships in the United States Navy's fleet. The reworked Regulus hangars are the heart of the troop delivery system. Each is now divided into a wet side with lockout hangar and transfer trunk and a dry side for tr The hangar door is opened. Ship's divers mushed out on deck in its cradle. A block is fastened to a deck pad eye. The outhaul cable is winched from inside the hangar. To avoid damaging the dive planes, they will be installed on deck. For actual operation
China Lake's been a pretty busy place the last 10 years. A lot of new weapons have been developed, and a lot of old standbys updated to fill new fleet demands. Fuel Air Explosive, or FAE, is another useful weapon. Its development was accelerated because of the Vietnam War. Dropped from an aircraft, the weapon dissipates a ground-hugging explosive cloud, which detonates. clearing brush, trees, bunkers, and mines from the area. Two versions make the weapon useful with both slow speed and jet aircraft. This canteen is just as effective as any bomb in its own little way. Unscrew the lid, and a couple of pounds of plastic go off. Same with this camera, or this flashlight. On a quick response basis, NWC develops unusual weapons for SEAL and underwater demolition teams. A secure radio detonator with over 8,000 trigger combinations. Also, special magazines, modified shotguns, pistols, and a lot of special ordnance. Often, a long-distance phone call would be enough to get a new weapon under design. The idea was to get the weapon to the troops when they needed it. The night observation gunship, NOGS, is another example of NWC contractor coordination. The gun, the plane, and the unique infrared search set came from different contractors. And in Vietnam, at night, the results were good. In 1964, we were just getting into the infrared search business with this Adam Seeker that worked well for 1964. Six generations later, infrared search sets are a combat reality, working in NOGS and planned for the A7E. A lot of what develops at NWC is dependent on basic research. Research in solid state physics, infrared detectors, magnetic materials, combustion, and weather modification. One of the things you can say about research is that uh, uh, it forms, it produces the background information that's necessary for any technological development. It's possible then for the development people to come over on a day-to-day -day basis and tune in to what you're doing and try to relate their problems to what you're doing. We're doing basic research on these materials because that's what we have to know first. Another point strikes me is that it takes such a short time for the development types to use up what new technology is available at any given time that it keeps a person pretty busy trying to produce new things that they can work into the devices they're making. This is a, uh, a, a great turnaround from the pre-Second World War era when uh, in the lag time between a, a research development and a technological use uh, may have been 20, 30 years. Five years of our work gets used up in about a year. Well, there you have it. A quick look at what Naval Weapons Center China Lake is all about. What we've done in the past and what we'll be up to in the future. <laughs>